So we're going to take a look at a couple of passages from Scripture, stories in the book of Genesis uh, about some people that God chose to work in among and through and who were completely messed up, which is encouraging to me because I'm kind of messed up. And I was thinking like if I had a slide or like if I wanted to put up an image of like that would describe some of the people in the Old Testament, this particular group of people, I almost felt like I could put like the days of our lives, like the soap opera, you know, there's always scandal involved and something crazy going on or maybe like the real lives of Jersey Shore, the Kardashians, anything from Twitter. I don't know, I could put it up here and just like, it would capture kind of the chaos that is humanity, and yet in the midst of that chaos and that brokenness, and its brokenness, God chooses to work, which I think is awesome. <laughs> and it gives me a lot of hope, because it means he's working in me too. It's not going to give up. Yeah, so let's pray. Father God, we love you. You are such a good father. You're so gracious, you're so merciful, you're so holy, you're so set apart, you're so high above, and yet, and yet, God, you choose to interact with us. You choose to condescend, to come down to our level, to engage us, to meet with us, to work in us and through us, to save us, to call us. And Jesus, you demonstrated your love for us in this. While we were sinners, you died for us. You came 2,000 years ago as a baby. Father, you're a good father. For those of us here that know you today, Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts and minds. You'd help us to be people that follow you, that are transformed by you. Lord, for those in the room who maybe don't know you yet, I pray that you would call them unto yourself, that they would be receptive to your Holy Spirit's work. Even today, God, you want them to meet with you. You see them, you hear them, you know them, and maybe they don't know you, but they're here for some strange reason. They don't even know why, but God, you know why. Oh, Jesus, we know you're gonna do something in us and through us today. So use me, I pray, God, for your kingdom and glory. Use the broken me that I am. Lord, would you move our hearts and minds for your kingdom and glory. Amen. Awesome. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> so excited. The first two services. Um, this is not, by the way, a sermon that I would typically preach. This is not. You'll see why, I think. Um, no, there's nothing heretical in it, okay? It's like, oh, no, where's he going here? Uh, usually, I like to stick to the stuff that I'm really familiar with, which is the New Testament, uh, maybe business, economics, accounting, finance. That's where my mind naturally goes, marketing. That's the sort of stuff I teach on a daily basis. And yet, when I was preparing and praying about what I thought God would want to say to you uh, and me, is that he sees us and he hears us in the midst of our brokenness, in our trials and tribulations, and that he has a plan even in some of that brokenness. That's not usually the sermon I would preach, which is why I'm stoked, because it means God is doing something, and I've already seen it in the first two services. And so I expect, I expect, I anticipate that God will meet you now. I don't know if you came prepared for that, but that's what I'm, that's what I'm amped up for. So we'll get into it. Okay, Genesis chapter 16. Oh, Jesus, you are at work, moving us. Awesome. I'd like to think it's the spirit. Maybe it's just caffeine. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Genesis chapter 16. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 16, but by way of backstory, there's a few characters we're going to meet, right? We've got Abram, we've got Sarai, and Hagar, okay? And We'll talk about them a little bit more in depth, but really important to know, in Genesis chapter 12, uh, God, which is the first book of the Bible, for those of you, maybe you're, you're new to church, Genesis is kind of the beginning, right? That's what it means, the beginning, and how God is working, what he's up to, humanity's rejection of God, and then God launches into this awesome rescue mission. And he's going to use people to bring some of that rescue mission to fulfillment. 
And he calls a guy named Abram, who's married to a gal named Sarai, and he tells them you're gonna have a child. Now, Sarah is barren, she can't have kids. So already God's showing up and he says, I'm gonna do something miraculous in you and through you, despite what all the circumstances say. It's impossible, yes, but with God all things are possible. And so he shows up and he promises Abraham, this is the story, this is what's gonna happen. Now Abram and Sarah, like me, are slow to learn. They make a lot of mistakes, a lot of mistakes. And they're not just little mistakes, they're big mistakes. In chapter 12, receives the blessing, or sorry, 15, they really receive, but God calls Abram in chapter 12, and he tells him he's gonna make him a mighty nation. That's so cool. Abram's like, I can't even have kids, but that sounds awesome. <laughs> they wander through Egypt, and while they're in Egypt, Sarah and Abram, Sarah's incredibly beautiful. This is what we're told in the text, okay? Abram's afraid that the Egyptians may really want Sarai and they're gonna come and kill him in order to marry her, or, okay? So, this, so they, they hatch a plan. He says, hey, listen, if anybody noticed, you know, if they, want, they noticed you're really beautiful, they may wanna kill me, how about you just tell everybody you're my sister? Ladies, how would you feel about that, by the way? Like, not so much? Okay, my wife would slap me, and rightly so. She should. Uh, but anyway, Sarah goes along with this. Pharaoh ends up being enticed by her beauty and has her come into kind of his harem. Now, we don't see anything happen, but she's there. And all of a sudden, Herod, or sorry, Pharaoh, uh, as part of this whole procedure, pays a dowry to Abram. Part of that dowry may have been the slave girl, Hagar. So Hagar, a few chapters earlier, is kind of, apart from any sort of will or desire she has, she's now a part of Abram's kind of clan. She's probably a piece of payment. That's a little bit of foreshadowing of what's to come. So Abram and Sarah, they come up with these plan anyway. God works through it in their brokenness, their mistakes. God's still at work. Okay, so we're going to pick it up now in chapter 16. Chapter 16. Oh, chapter 15. Ten years earlier, Abram has promised that he's going to have a kid. He's 75 years old when he gets that promise. Okay, so you're going to have a kid, Abram. He's like, man, I'm really old. That's great. He's 75 years old. Chapter 15, you're going to have a kid. Chapter 16 is where we're going to pick it up. He's now 10 years older. Doesn't have a kid yet. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, Now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. This is Sarai's idea, by the way. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. So Abram listened to the voice of Sarai after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan. So he had received the promise 10 years earlier. Abram's wife Sarai took Hagar the Egyptian, her maid, and gave her to her husband Abram as his wife. Now he went into Hagar and she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her sight. Whoa, days of our lives. Bible is not G-rated. I know we like to clean it up, but it is not G-rated, okay? God doesn't mince failures and mistakes. So they decide to hatch this plan, right? God has promised us we're gonna have a kid. 10 years goes by and they're thinking, you know, this ain't happening fast enough. Why don't we just take matters into our own hands? We'll make it happen. I know how we can do it, surrogacy. Now that's not an uncommon practice during this era, right? Hagar belongs, she's property, Okay, again, we don't want to impose our 21st century view on the text. We have to look at it at that time. She is property of Abram. So they're saying anything that belongs to you belongs to us. That includes your womb. That's heavy stuff. Okay? So they come up with this plan. By the way, how much authority does Hagar have over any of this? None. She has absolutely no authority. Okay? She's at the behest of Sarai and Abram. So she, has a, she, she becomes pregnant, and all of a sudden she begins to despise Sarai. I'm not entirely surprised. Human beings being who we are, I could see how that would be a challenge. 
Okay, like there, there's a lot of brokenness going on here, right? I mean, Abram's broken, he's willing to do this. Sarai's broken, she's trying to accomplish God's will some other way. Hagar's broken. There's a lot of brokenness going around. But she, con- she conceives. And Sarai said to Abram, may the wrong done to me be upon you. <laughs> wow. That's a household. May the wrong done to me be upon you. I gave my maid into your arms, but when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her sight. May the Lord judge between me and you. Woo! Invoking the name of God. That's some pretty heavy stuff. But Abram said to Sarai, they don't have a, at this point it doesn't seem like they have a very functional relationship. But Abram said to Sarai, behold, your maid is in your power to do to her what is right in your sight. Do to her however you want. So Sarai treated her harshly. Wow. These are, are we sure these are God's people? They're becoming God's people. And he works with them in their brokenness. He works with me in my brokenness. So Sarai treated her harshly and Hagar fled from her presence. She ran away, pregnant, single, doesn't know what's going to happen. No authority, no rights. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. He said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. She doesn't even know where she's going. She doesn't even know. Doesn't have a plan. She's just, just scared. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, Listen to this. Return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Wow. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count. What? The angel of the Lord said to her further, Behold, you are with child, and you will bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, which means he listens, he hears, God hears. God listens. He will be a wild donkey of a man, that is true. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him. And he will live to the east of all of his brothers. We know there's going to be conflict between the offspring of Ishmael and the offspring of Isaac. That's foreshadowing. We know what's going to happen. And yet God is still looking after Hagar in spite of what he knows is coming. And all, all of this, this tragedy that will come, he's still looking after her. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are a God who sees. For she said, have I even remained alive here after seeing him? She saw God. We'll get that in just a sec. Therefore, the well was called Ber Lahoi Roy. Behold, it is between Kadesh and, and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him. So we've got four characters at this point in our story, right? We've got Abram. Abram's name means exalted father, which is kind of cool. Up to this point, is he an exalted father? No, he has no kids. And yet God still calls him exalted father. It's a promise. You can bank on it. It's coming. You will be an exalted father. Sarai... Uh, her name means princess. And I'm, based on some of the behavior, I'm, I'm assuming there's a little bit of that attitude, right, that goes with princess. Like, I'm a princess. I'm going to tell you what to do. There's a little bit of this, it's, it's up to me, it's mine, I want it, who knows. She's the one that came up with the plan with Hagar. She's also accusing Abraham after the fact. By the way, Abraham's response should have been, Sarah, I love you. I get what you're trying to do. But no, if God's promised us a child, he's going to do it through you. It's going to be a miracle. It's going to be awesome. But he goes, no, maybe this makes sense. He leans into the flesh and thinks, you know what? I, we can do this. God's made us a promise. Now it's just up to us to take over. Then we come to our third person, Hagar. We, we talked about her. She's an Egyptian, so she's a foreigner. She doesn't look like everybody in the group. She's a slave, a maid. She's probably fairly young, maybe in her late teens, early 20s. 
She's a woman, and in that era means she has no real rights to speak of. So she really is at the behest of these folks. She's a minority. She's cast aside. She's kind of this marginalized. She's at the command of Sarah and Abram's will and really doesn't have any authority of her own, right? Broken. So we have Sarah, and yet God sees her. And then we have this fourth character, the angel of the Lord that shows up, reveals himself to Hagar when she's run away. Now what's interesting is this, this title, angel of the Lord, is used several times in the Old Testament. But the first time it appears is in this instance. It's used in Exodus chapter 3. Do you guys remember what happened in Exodus chapter 3? God reveals himself to Moses. Where? In a burning bush. So it's, it seems that it's God shows up in some sort of physical way. We don't always understand what it means, but God is present. Now what I love about this story is that we know that Abram has received a promise. We know that Sarai has received a promise. That's beautiful. Hagar, we kind of typically cast to the, the margins, right? The outside, ah, okay, yeah, 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 move on. But is that how God treats her? Not at all. She's out, she's scared, she's running away, she has no idea where she's going, and God shows up on the scene and reveals himself to her. Like, think about it. Like, that's not how we typically operate and function, and yet that's exactly how God functions. You may feel broken. You may feel like you've been cast aside. God sees you. He hears you. He knows you. Oh, that is good news, isn't it? That is such good news. This young woman, God loves. And not only does he show up and just, you know, he's compassionate on her. He asks her where she's going. He also does what? Like, that would be enough, right? If God just showed up and was like, I see you, I'm with you. But what does he do? Blessing upon blessing. I am going to bless that child that's in your womb. Yeah, there's going to be problems down the road. We know that. I'm God. I got this. But I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless him. And his name is going to mean he hears. God listens. Now, you know what I think is really cool about this story? Another piece Abraham actually names his son what? Ishmael. Well, where did he get the name from? Where did the name come from? It's pretty obvious. Ishmael, right? Who would have told him? Hagar. Hagar goes back. She was the one that received the name, not Abram. She received the name. So she goes back home. She submits to Sarai and Abram, which I got to imagine is tough, but she knows that God is with her. So she goes back and submits. She tells them the story. I was running away, I was terrified, I was scared, I didn't know what to do. God showed up and met me. He saw me, he heard me, he sees. I'm not abandoned. Me, of all people. And he said, my son's gonna be named Ishmael, which means he listens. She gives that testimony to Abram. And Abram goes, yep, that sounds kinda like how God works with me too. He does the unexpected shows up in ways that I don't anticipate, and yet he's at work. I think that's awesome. Her testimony bears weight because God is behind her. So we see in this story already mankind's ability to mess things up, right? We get involved, we want to take control, and yet when God shows up, he begins to redeem things. He works things. He's there. He's transforming. He's extending mercy and blessing upon Hagar, upon Sarai, and upon Abram. He's going to bless Ishmael. God hears. He will be a multitude. Hagar has a testimony. So let's fast forward. Let's go to Genesis chapter 21. So so Ishmael grows. He's about 13 years old now. So it's amazing how fast time goes by in the Old Testament, right? You go from one chapter to the next 10 years, 15 to 16, 10 years has gone by. You go from 16 to 21, about 13, 14 years has gone by. Abram is now 99 years old. Sarai is now 89 years old. You know what's a cool thing? Their names have changed. 
Where it was once Sarai, princess, it's now Sarah. The h in the end is God's breath. It's the image of God's breath. He breathes. Sarah's being transformed as God breathes. Abraham has gone from exalted father, it's, or Abram, it's now Abraham. It's a h at the end again, God's breath. He's working in Abram. It's now Abraham, which means the chief of a multitude, the father of a multitude. God's like, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Abram's like, I still don't have that chosen, that, that promised kid. It's going to be through Ishmael, right? God's like, nah, -uh. I'm going to bless Ishmael. Sure, that's who I am. I'm still at work. So Hagar's received this blessing. Abram has received this blessing. Sarah has been told she'll be a blessing, and yet it hasn't come to fruition yet. Let's pick it up. Genesis chapter 21. Then the Lord took note of Sarah, as he had said. There's a promise. God's going to fulfill it, right? And the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Isaac's the promise. Means he laughs. Because Abraham and Sarah, when God told them they were going to have a kid that old, they were like, yeah, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> nah, it doesn't work like that right? I think also God laughs. I don't think it's just like uh, Abraham and Sarah laughed. I think God also laughs. He's like, oh, I'm going to do something. It's going to knock your socks off and you guys are going to be blown away because that's what God does when he shows up. He does awesome things. So Abraham called the name of his son Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Uh, in the New Testament, it says he considered his body as good as dead. So he knew God was doing something. Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children, yet I have borne him a son in his old age? The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. That's beautiful, right? They've received this beautiful little boy, Isaac, the promise this is through him that, that Jesus will eventually come through his lineage. Oh, sweet. God is at work. It's all good. Oh, but old habits die hard. The sin nature, the side of eternity, we wrestle. Let's keep reading. Now Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, mocking. He was mocking Isaac. Now, the, the Hebrew word there can mean mocking in kind of a negative way, obviously, the connotation of making fun of, putting down, mistreating. It can also be used to mean he's being playful. Who knows? Galatians makes the argument in chapter 4 that there is some sort of ill effort there, right? Like, like maybe Ishmael's jealous. We don't know. It's quite possible, okay? Who knows? I have kids. They tell me stories all the time about what's going on and I see them behave towards one another. And I can tell you, I don't always know if it's ill or if it's just them just being them, <laughs> okay? I don't know. Regardless of the fact, okay, Sarah sees this taking place. Sarah and Hagar don't have the best relationship. Let's just put it that way. Is that fair to say? Am I misreading the text? I don't think so. She sees this taking place Therefore, she said to Abraham, drive out this maid. It's like this maid. It's like, get him out of here. And her son. For the son of this maid shall not be an heir with my son Isaac. Now, Old Testament rule, Isaac was the firstborn. Because he was firstborn of both the head and like male and female of the house. So he was going to receive the inheritance. There was no question about that. But inheritance is power. Right? And I think Sarah's saying, that's that old nature saying, I don't want anything to do with him. Nothing. Get him out of here. So, again, this matter distressed Abraham greatly because of his son. He loves Ishmael. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the lad and your maid. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her, for through Isaac your descendants shall be named. One real cool piece this matter distresses Abram, but what does he do? He actually listens to God this time. 
He goes and seeks God's counsel. He doesn't go off and do it himself. He goes and seeks the Lord. So you see transformation in Abram's life. All of a sudden he's learning, slowly, but he's learning. That process of transformation and sanctification is coming to fruition. He is changing. And God says this, and of the son of the maid, I will make a nation also because he is your descendant. He says, I'm going to bless him. I'm going to look after him. I love him. I'm with him. So Abram rose early in the morning and took bread and, and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. Not exactly a lot of p- p- possessions there, provisions, putting them on her shoulder and gave her the boy and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. Here she is wandering again. When the water and the skin was used up, she left the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him, about a bow shot away. So you think of like an arrow, right? It's a distance away. It's not that far, maybe 100 yards or something like that. Do not let me see the boy die. So Ishmael's about to die. Like this, is, this is dire straits. This isn't just like, oh, I'm a little thirsty. She's weeping. She lifted up her voice and she wept. Maybe you feel that way. Maybe you feel that way. Maybe you felt that way. Maybe that's been part of your story. How does God respond? God heard the lad crying. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven, this time from heaven, and said to her, what is the matter with you, Hagar? It's not a negative. It's actually a very tender tone. Do not fear, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. God sees him. God sees you. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him by the hand, for I will make a great nation of him. And this is cool. Verse 19, then God opened her eyes, as he often does with us. And she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. Now God was with the lad, and he grew, and he lived in the wilderness and became an archer. I love that, that God was with him. The promise ultimately comes through Isaac. We know that. He's the promised one. And yet I can't help but think that God even demonstrates his love for Ishmael. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He offers us a choice to choose to follow him and to know him. And in this, he is providing for Hagar a blessing as well as Ishmael. What I find so fascinating about this story is it's easy for me It's easy for me to operate in ignorance or blindness to the marginalized. It's easy. Sometimes it's just default position. You don't even mean it, you just just operate that way. But that's not how God operates. He doesn't operate like that at all. In fact, he sees those who have been cast out and he works. So he sees the marginalized, the broken, the ones who have no control and authority and he wants to work in them and through them. But it's not just there. He also sees Abraham and Sarah and wants to work in them and through them and does so by providing them a miraculous baby, Isaac. So when I read a story like this, I see humanity's mess. Like I see what I'm good at, making messes. And then what I also see is God intervening and saying, even in your brokenness, I'm going to do a work. Even in the mess, I'm going to be there. I will be present. I will be out. I will be redemptive. I will be the one to bring about transformation. And what that does is it gives me hope, knowing that I can't and I don't need to discard anybody. God is at work in them. If you feel like giving up on something, don't give up. Lean in. Pray. Ask God to work. He listens. He sees, and not just you, he sees them. That's not mine. (laughs) Brent's like, wrap it up. No. (laughs) God is at work. And the application, I think, in our day and age is this, right? Abram and Sarah, if you want to think of them this way, they were the ones who had been given the promise. They were the ones that had talked with God. They should have known better. They should have acted a different way, but guess what? They also were work in progress. Sometimes maybe you've been hurt by the church. Maybe things have gone sideways. Maybe you've been the one that's hurt somebody as the church. 
right? God is still at work, right? God sees you. If you're the one that has caused that, that fallout, then go and seek reconciliation. That's what God has called us to, this beautiful work of reconciliation. But if you've been hurt, maybe you're going through a tough time now, maybe you've been cast to the margins, you've been set aside, maybe it's at work, there's been a promotion you've been looked over for, or maybe it's in a relationship where you feel abandoned. God sees you. He hears you. Keep in mind, it took 25 years. Maybe this is not the part that's so hopeful. But Abraham and Sarah received the promise. It took 25 years for it to come to fruition. Sometimes we want it like that, right? Don't lose hope. God is at work. He sees you. He listens. He loves you. And he loves them. We know that the ultimate fulfillment of the promise of Isaac isn't Isaac, is it? Isaac is one step. But who's the ultimate fulfillment of the promise to Abraham? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. And guess what? Jesus wants to save all of the Ishmaelites as well. Ishmael has to look to God for salvation. Jesus is the ultimate. He is God. He's Emmanuel. He is with us. And now through his Holy Spirit, he actually resides in us. That's the hope we have. So when I look at this story, you know, the days of our lives is, is no joke. Like, it's a mess. Bible doesn't mince words. It's a mess. We're a mess. The world is a mess. And yet God is intervening and working he has provided us a way through Jesus Christ. He has called us who belong to him to be part of that redemption work, to be salt and light in a world that so desperately needs him. You get to be that living testimony of God's provision and work. Be about that work. Know that God, he's, he's doing a thing. He sees you, he's listening. He also sees that person next to you at work that may drive you nuts right? He sees them and hears them as well, and he wants to do a work in their life. I guess I'll call the worship team forward. I'm, I'm getting used to this. Third time you'd figure I'd figure it out, but so don't lose heart. God is good. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you don't abandon us. You don't give up on us. You keep working. You never stop working. You are so good. Thank you for being faithful to Abraham, to Sarah, to Hagar, to Ishmael, to Isaac. Lord, and to all of us by providing us salvation through yourself, through Jesus Christ, your son. And Lord, over each person in this room, you know where they're at. You see them. You hear them. You know the things and the situations they're in. Maybe some of the trials they're facing or experiences they've had, and you want to work in that and through that. Jesus, you are that powerful that you can redeem even broken, broken experiences. Lord, for those of us that know you, we pray that we would sense your presence, we would listen to you, we would praise you because you are at work and we can trust you until we meet you in glory. Lord, for those in this space that maybe don't know you yet, but they've heard this and they're thinking, you know what, I don't belong. Holy Spirit, would you draw them to you? Would they know that they are exactly where they belong, that you desire to know them and walk in relationship with them, that you are calling them to experience you, the living God, just as you did Hagar, just as you did Sarah, just as you did Abraham. Father God, we declare that you are good. You're a good, good father. You never give up. You never stop working. We love you. Amen.